Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. Uh, we've been in a series called Supporting Cast, uh, looking at the fact that the Bible is the story of God, about God. He's the hero. He's the main character. And, and that there's many supporting cast members throughout Scripture that we can learn a lot from. Uh, really, that we would understand God better and, and understand man's role with God, and, and it would help us even where we're at today. Also, I'm, helping that it, it, I'm hoping that it helps us um, understand our Bibles and the big story of scripture. Uh, for some of us, maybe we've had a chance to get through some of these stories before. Um, maybe you grew up in church, and so you've heard some of the Bible stories coming up through uh, maybe the, the children's church programs when you're a kid. Um, maybe you, you didn't get that opportunity. I, I don't know uh, where your background is. Maybe this is your first experience with church or with the Word. Um, I think it's very beneficial for all of us. Uh, whether we have no experience coming in or we've heard some of these stories a million times, to continue to get into the Word. Um, the Word is alive and active. It's, it's the inspired Word of God. It's breathed. It's, uh, it, it does a work in us continually, even if it's the same words we're reading. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You can read a scripture, and it, and it really touches you. And another time in life, you read it again, and God speaks something different out of the same space. And so I'm just believing that as we go through these stories, we get more familiar with um, kind of the big picture story of, of God and the Bible, uh, that it would do that in us, that it would be fresh and it would be new, even if it's a story we've heard before. And if it's the first time we're hearing some of these stories, just hold on to your seats. Uh, it, it's an amazing story of God's goodness, his love, his grace, his sovereignty, his righteousness, um, his power, and so it's been a fun time. We've kind of started at the beginning of the Bible going through uh, some of the main characters in Scripture. We won't go through all the characters in Scripture because that would take us generations and generations to do so, but um, we'll go through all the, the main characters. We're in uh, uh, kind of a character study of Moses. Look at the story of Moses, and he's a significant person in Scripture, and so we're spending several weeks looking at him. And so the first week, we, we just talked about the state of God's people and, and that God raises up Moses in his divine plan so that there is a, a person that he would work through, that he would call Moses to himself on his mission uh, to deliver his people. Anybody here for that? Okay. Um, and, and that from there, we see that God works through him, even though Moses is kind of standoffish against the idea that, that God works through him to show his might and his strength. And, and maybe you've heard of the, the plagues that happened in Egypt and, and Pharaoh's heart against God and against God's people, and, and that God does this amazing, delivering, saving work of his people. The exodus happens, that God takes his people from bondage and slavery and brings them out of that space and headed towards the promised land that he has something for them. And we looked at last week that uh, God's protection and the praise of God and his provision through bringing miraculous water um, and food for God's people. And it's kind of where we'll pick up today in another provisional uh, miracle to start us off, but we won't stay there. And a lot of what we're going to look at today with Moses is, if you're taking notes, learning to lead. Learning to lead. I want to pray before we uh, jump into this. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you that you are faithful, that your presence is here because you say it is when we gather in your name. God, as we, as we praise you, as we pray to you and we open your word, Lord, I pray that you would do a work inside of all of us in our hearts. God, help us to understand you even uh, in our minds. And God, I just pray that you would do a transforming work in our lives. God, on a, on a congregational level, on a church level, I pray that you would uh, use your word to direct us as a whole also. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, um, Exodus 17 and 18 is where we're going to spend our time today. Uh, we'll jump to a couple other places in the New Testament, but primarily we're going to spend our time going through the majority of the verses um, in Exodus 17 and 18. By the majority, I mean all but one. The last one. Um, and you can read that on your own. I just wanted to save time, so I cut the last verse of the second chapter. You're welcome, those that are in the hard chairs. Um, <laughs> So if you're taking notes, we're going to look at a lot of leadership today um, from a biblical perspective, and God puts all these stories back to back, and I think it's uh, obviously on purpose. And so this first part we're going to look at, maybe right, God established authority. God established authority. God established leadership and authority. Where we find ourselves is the people have been complaining against Moses anytime there's a struggle out in the wilderness. They've left slavery, bondage, uh, and oppression, and now they're free from that. Now they're in this place where, where it's clear that God is with them, that he's with them either by a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, so they always know God is with us, and they're walking this journey. They're following after God. He saved them from the Egyptians that have come after them. He's provided water. He, he's provided food in this miraculous way every single morning. They go out and get this miracle. It's huge. God is showing himself over and over that he's trustworthy, that he's loving, that he's taking care of them. Um, and they continue to, anytime a struggle comes up, uh, argue against Moses and, and really be frustrated with what God's plan is in this. And we're going to see that again here. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. And so they're doing what God said, following after um, God speaking to Moses. And they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. That's a problem. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. <laughs> Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the per people were thirsty for water there and grumbled against Moses. We talk about grumbling as kind of an undertone, um, rumbling against and, and, and towards they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? The Bible says in, in Psalm 95, it references this story. And, and it says that the people there, not only did they quarrel against Moses and test God, but it says that they hardened their hearts. That They, they hardened their hearts. And, and so they're uh, against Moses, they're against God, and they're kind of at this like, well, where's God now? I forgot, every, like, picture this. That morning, they would have gone to get their, their food from the ground that God miraculously provided. That day. And then go like, well, where is he now? Yeah. Then Moses cried out to the Lord. This is awesome. What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. So, so God's in this amazing delivering work, and then he takes them through the Red Sea, wipes out the Egyptians that are after them, and, and, and now has them in this place where he provides for them daily so that they see over and over, every morning they see God cares for us, God cares for us, God cares for us. And now they're complaining against Moses, um, they're, they're testing God, and, and they're ready to kill Moses. Okay. It's a rough day. The Lord answered Moses, I love this. Check this out. Go out in front of the people or pass by in the front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. So they're higher ups, the, the ones that they uh, look up to in each one of these, the, these tribes and amongst the people. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. So God has been working miraculous things through the staff that Moses has. He says, Hold that because it's a sign that God is, is with him about to do something because God continues to work through this with Moses. Go in front of the people so all the people see you. Take the elders with you, which is kind of the people above uh, the, the regular people. Take them with you. Hold the staff and go. And I love this. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So another miracle. God is so patient in this. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord. And that's what, literally what those means, testing and quarreling. Because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? What I love about this and what I didn't... Um, uh, originally, I was going to teach this last week with the, the 
provisional miracles, and although part of that is there and it's amazing, I love what God does to continue to establish who, who he's put kind of in charge uh, of them and show the people, look, pass in front of the people. I want them to see that, that you're going to a place, that the elders are in front of them going with you, that you're in front of the elders, that I'm with you with the staff that I told you to take in your hand. And, and, and then he says this, I love it, I'm going to stand before you. And he shows this like divine order of like God's the one leading everybody. He is establishing again that Moses is the one he's chosen to work through, that God confirms the leadership. The people complain, but God confirms. Moses cries out like, they're going to kill me. And God's like, okay, I'm going to show again that I'm in charge. I care. I'm going to provide. And I'm going to remind them again that I'm the one that put you in this position. Okay. Okay. And so we see this uh, kind of cool showing of leadership as the, the God is first. He has him use the staff to, again, signify that it's God's power and not Moses's, but that Moses is the one that, that has been called to stand before the people, that the elders would be there and that the people would see what's going on, that God would confirm the leadership. And I love it. It's not Moses doing a power play. It's God confirming leadership. It's not Moses like lifting up the staff and being like, remember this? God gave me this. Okay. That, that, that can be a tendency um, of prideful leadership, right? Like I have this position and you will respect my title. But that here, Moses cries out like God, understanding that any leadership in that space that, that God has called him to this, this godly leadership and and. Okay, in this, it's not my job to confirm it, it, that God does that. Okay. So God establishes his authority. He provides for his people. And then the next thing that happens in Scripture is pretty cool. If you're taking notes, right, strength of diversity. So they're in this place where God has just reestablished, reconfirmed, the, the leadership structure that he has and, and shown again his, his provision for his people and his power. That when you think you have nothing, God instantly can change the situation by hitting a rock and water comes out to feed a couple million people and livestock. Okay. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. So they're in the same place that they were where the water comes out of the rock. And the Amalekites come to attack them. This is the first battle that they've seen. The Bible told us, uh, we saw kind of last week, last couple of weeks, that when they leave Egypt, they have the, the provisions, they have the tools necessary to do battle. But God said they took them a, a kind of a roundabout way because they weren't ready for war. Their hearts weren't ready to, to do that kind of thing. They might turn back and go home, but they had the stuff. And so now, instead of them going through a place where there might be war, a battle has come to them. The, Amal the Amalekites come and attack the Israelites. I love this. Moses said to Joshua, and this is us first learning about Joshua. We're going to learn about him a lot in the weeks to come. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Okay, some of you have heard this story before. If you haven't, this is, and if you have, this is an amazing story. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. So there's these people that are coming against us. Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I want you to lead a, a group of men, choose guys to go battle down below. I'm going to go up with Aaron and Hurry. He goes up on top of the hill, um, up on the hill while, while Joshua's down below with the guys with swords. So Moses says, I'm going to go up with a stick. But it's this like special one that God shows himself through. And I'm going to go with a couple guys and we're going to go up on the hill. And then you go with guys that... Um, you guys should not bring sticks. You should probably bring swords. <laughs> and as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, <laughs> you ever just try to keep your hands up for very long and then put something in your hands? 
it starts getting heavy a lot faster than you would imagine. His hands grew tired. His weakness is shown. They took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. Okay, we need you to keep your hands up. We want to make sure that you can keep doing this because it kind of matters. If your hands are up, we're winning. If they're not, uh, we're losing. So here, why don't, you, why don't you sit here? Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So he's got these two guys. Like, I love this. Moses goes up in the hill. It's this amazing thing. He's, he's lifting this up to God, and he keeps his hands up. They're winning down below. His hands start to go down. They start losing down below. If Moses was the only one on the hill, there'd be a problem. So Moses' hands start to get tired, and, and thankfully he's got some guys there to be like, hey, why don't you sit here, and we'll hold your hands up. Because it's very important that, that this comes all the way to completion, that there's victory that happens on the battlefront. And so we're going to do this kind of side gig and hold your hands up. Okay. So Joshua, I love this. A, it just showed us the importance of having a team. But so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. This is kind of, it's not necessarily confusing, but you, you kind of see lots of different things at play here. It says that Joshua overcame the Amalekite army. Did Joshua overcome the Amalekite army? Yes. With the sword? Yes. Would it have happened if there wasn't some other things that, going on? <laughs> no. Who gets the credit right there for that happening? Joshua. But then, it, then you kind of look and go, well, yeah, but he should give some credit to Moses because if Moses doesn't do this, he doesn't win. You're right. But if Moses isn't turning to God and God being the one that's lifted up and, and lifted high and all this, nobody wins. And, and so that God will get the ultimate credit, but we see like all of these diverse things happening at once, that God gets the victory and the glory in all of it, and that others get the victory in playing their part. That all things are necessary, not just Moses lifting his hands, not just Aaron and her holding his arms, not just Joshua out there with the sword. He's not by himself. There's a whole army of people. And, and that everybody's playing their part and, and working in um, what they have there, using what's in their hand, using the position that they've been given, and, and, and that the ultimate victory is given to God, but that Israel gets a victory in, in the working out of what God's called them to do. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek under heaven, from under heaven. God says, those people come against me. They've come against my people. I'm going to get rid of them. Write down what happened today because I want it as a reminder for Joshua. I want him to hear how this went down. Moses built an altar and called it the Lord is my banner. That's so cool. The idea of the banner there is the, the one that is above. The, the one that bring, brings us together. That, that if that flag is being waved, we know where to come to. We know what we represent and who represents us. That God is the ultimate above all. And that by the lifting up of hands, he's saying, the Lord is my banner. And I love that he went up there um, with the staff, which signifies over and over the power of God and that God told him to use this thing on all these different occasions um, that he would hold it and say, like, God is the one. It, it, it's him. It's all his. He's the one that comes through for us. He's the one that we do any of this for. We trust in him. Uh, we follow him. He's the king. Hmm. So Moses built an altar and called it the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amal Amalekites from generation to generation. I love this, and I want to focus for a couple minutes um, on the strength of diversity and the strength of different people playing different parts, but all of it being used together for the ultimate goal and glory of God. That, that the victory comes through everyone playing out their part. Because if, if everybody went up on the hill and just lifted up their hands, that wouldn't work. Somebody had to go fight. If everybody would have gone down to the valley to, to fight, it wouldn't have worked because there, there were some people that were supposed to be on the hill. 
And like I said, if Moses goes up there by himself, it says his hands got tired. He wasn't going to make it. Everyone was going to die (laughs) because of Moses' own weakness and that by himself, he's not meant to do it by himself. And and so there's this this beauty of of having a team, of everybody playing out their parts um, and and the reliance on each other. I love in, in 1 Corinthians, and I've preached this several times, but I think it fits to where we're at today. 1 Corinthians 12, different role, but same goal. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. That's so awesome. That's so awesome because we're so different. All of us. And how devastating would it be to look around and go like, oh, I have to be just like everybody. Now, we are all being transformed to the image of Christ. And in that, God has chosen that we would all continue to be uh, unique in some of our giftings, in some of our history, in some of our passions, so that when we come together, we most glorify him by pointing to the head of this body, Jesus but that we've been made diverse on purpose. Okay. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? I want to stop there for a minute. I I, I love some of these statements. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Some of the wrong thinking there is, like, I'm not needed. I don't fit. I don't belong because I'm not like everybody else. If we follow along with what's being said here, the, the... Example is that we, the people of God, are the body of God, and all of us have parts inside of that body. That doesn't mean there's not some similarities in some of the parts, but that, but that there's also differences. And, and that it would be wrong to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. And, and I just want to help us with that, because it's something we, we try to constantly uh, have in front of us as a reminder that when we come and if we feel like, man, it's hard for me to figure out exactly where I fit, that doesn't mean you don't fit. It might just mean um, there's not anyone like you because you're unique as part of this body. That doesn't mean there's not a connection place. That doesn't mean that there's not um, a, a, a place for the thriving of your giftings. And, and in that, it's a strengthening of the entire body, an edifying of the body and a glorifying of Jesus. That if we come in and we go like, well, everybody looks like an ear and I'm a foot, It doesn't mean I go like, oh, man, I should go somewhere else where it's all about feet. Because I need to make sure that feet thrive for the place that I'm at. So I just want a thousand feet to gather. Stink. (laughs) You hear what I'm saying? Like the the foot is necessary for the body, and so it would be wrong for it to come in and go like, oh, there's only a couple of us here. Like me, I don't fit. No, you do. That's why we need feet. And we need ears and hands and eyes. And, and, and that it's, it's beautiful as we discover how we're built and who, who we are and, and how God has placed us in his body. In fact, but in fact, God has placed, this is verse 18, the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts. But one body, it goes on. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, I want to stop there for a second. Here's the other side of the wrong thinking. Where the first part says, I'm not like everybody else. I'm not needed. I don't fit. I don't belong. The other side that that is the wrong thinking is 
you're not like us, you don't fit, you don't belong. But it's, it's two sides of the same wrong statement. To say, oh, look, I'm different, so I'm not here, or you're different, you don't fit here. That's, there's no place. There's no place for that. We come together, and I love how it starts all of this off, off by reminding us, regardless, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, if we're in Christ, then we come together as his body. And our differences is what brings us strength. It's a witness to the world where, where the world tries to divide and divide and divide that Christ would bring us together in him. Okay. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Man, I love that. That there is, we're going to see, um, structure and, and uh, in leadership and in an organizing of God's people, but there's, there's not a, an, a, an honor hierarchy of like, oh, the hands, they're more special than the ribs. Are you getting what I'm saying? But that all of us would understand, like, listen, if, if we think that there's different honor that should be given there, then, then we missed it and we ascribe too much honor to a place because it says here that God brings the level of honor up for the things that we don't think have as much honor. That, that he goes like, okay, some parts, they don't need any help with that. But, but God has, has the, taken the parts that are kind of hidden or off to the side and, and equated them so that all of us have concern for each other equally. Okay, I hope you're catching this. So that there should be no division in the body and that its parts should have equal concerns for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I mean, that's a, that's a good way to kind of gauge our hearts on kind of our, our, our feelings of if we do feel either prideful or, or too low uh, about where we fit. Is, is there a connection? Like, do, if someone suffers, do I feel that? Am I connected as a part of that? If someone... If someone has a win, am I able to rejoice or am I jealous that it wasn't me? Do I have equal concern? Is, is it like if they win, do I win? Yes. If they suffer, do I feel some of that and, and, and am I with them in that? Yes. That we wouldn't be alone in our celebration or in our pain, but that God would bring us together, hmm. even in our differences, which is so awesome. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. I think about how this plays out even on the battlefield that day against the Amalekites. That neither of them could look at each other and think they're not needed. That it's an obvious example of this playing out, like in a right now moment. That the guys swinging the swords couldn't go, couldn't go like, what are they doing? They don't even have to swing swords. We don't need them. Get rid of them. They would have been in a bad spot. And the guys on the hill can be like, look at, we get all the cool stuff up here. We're the one that everything matters on. Look, watch this. Because if you're here and they lose, guess who they're coming after next? The dude on the hill that everybody's watching go like, what's, what's the dance moves? Um, are you with me? Like you see it play out. Like really fast, Moses is, is, is reliant. The people are reliant on Moses and, and the, the, the people on the hill are, are dependent on the people down there and the people down there depend on the people up here. And, and if one of them suffers, they all suffer. If, if, if one of them gets victory and rejoices, they all get victory and rejoice. And all of it is to honor God and show that he's sovereign above all of it. Huh. And so we are as the church. With Jesus as our banner over everything. Colossians 1, 17 and 18 says this, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have suprem supremacy. That's awesome. That even in us being excited about what God does in the body, it's not so that we can brag about who we are as the body. It's so that we can point to the one that is above all things. 
Okay, I get excited about this stuff. Um, I think you're there with me. The last thing I want to look at, and, and, and I know if, I hope this is helpful for all of us. I know that if you are in some sort of leadership, not just in the church, but in general, um, some of these things I think will be very beneficial uh, to put into place. But the last point, if you could just, if you're taking notes, right, deep and wide. Maybe a sub note would be like organized for success. So after this victory, Exodus 18, starting verse 1, it says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, which we don't know when he sent her away, um, it's kind of assumed that when things were dangerous for the people of Israel, um, whether it be during the, the plague time or the exodus, the Red Sea, or now when the Amalekites come, that somewhere in there, Moses to his wife was like, hey, why don't you take our boys and go to your dad's house? His father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son, son named Gershom, and for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. The other named Eleazar, for he said, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now check this out. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and, and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. This is awesome. Moses is a leader of um, a couple million people. His father-in-law comes out and he shows a massive respect. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Listen to this. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. For he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in in the presence of God. Real quick, this is just kind of a side note. I I wanted to read that first section of this because I love the impact of the testimony of God's saving power. Then Moses says, like, he delivered us from these things. We've had all these hard times and told them about the Lord saving them. And that it impacted Jethro that he says, like, now because of what I'm hearing you saying and seeing how God has, has worked in and through you and the people, now I see that he's a God above everything. You know, it's interesting. We live in an information age, and information is very important. But oftentimes, people want to know more than just what hits in the head. They want to know on a practical level. Has God really been there for you? Like, there's, there's power in the testimony of your salvation. There's power in, in a, a real one-on-one, like, you know me, and you know who I was, and you know that I'm different now because God's going to work in me. I'm not perfect, but I'm different. And, and there's, there's power in that. And, and I don't think we just give our testimony without information or telling people who God is and all those things, but I think that, it's, that we need both. Because information without some sort of like transformation, without any sort of like uh, saving work that's happened in you, um, doesn't have the same strength as somebody hearing the information and realizing that the person saying it really believes what they're saying because they've interacted with God. Hmm. So it goes on to this, this leadership point I want to point out. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. He's a decision maker for all the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. That's a long day. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for all the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge or decision maker while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? It's a good question. That's a lot of people to be in charge of. Moses is trying to be the one that, that 
answers people's questions, um, and, and figures out disputes by himself over a massive amount of people. Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, which seems like a good thing, right? Like Moses is, Moses is like, I care for the people. And so when they have a problem, they bring it to me because I want to make sure that they know. I care that God, God's will and God's way is known. So when people are having these issues, they come to me. And it could be any size issue. It just, whenever a dispute came. Now listen to this. The, the leader of a couple million people, all the disputes are coming to him? What about like your animal came over and had a problem with my animal and now we have issues with each other? Let's see, I'm leading two million people. Often they don't have water. We depend on God to bring food every day. We move around, so that's a big issue. There's all these big level problems I got to think of, but everything comes to him. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. Why? Because what's going to happen? Moses, you can't keep up with that. The, the expectations that people have with you being that one vocal um, point uh, of what they should be doing and, and, and answering all these disputes will kill you. It'll wear you out. You can't keep up with that. And you, you can't keep up. So how are people going to feel about you not being able to meet that expectation? that not only are you going to be worn out, but the other people are, are, are going to not like the, the, the answer they get because the answer is going to be like, sorry, he doesn't have time for you today. <laughs> hmm. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. I love this. So what he was doing was very wide, and, and what his father-in-law is saying is like, add some depth, add some people with you um, to, to do this. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. This is awesome, too. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some advice, and then I'm just going to believe that God is with you on doing this or not. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. That's cool. Moses, you're trying to answer all these people's disputes and, and tell them about his, God's decrees and his instructions. Um, now what I want you to do is I want you to, you, why don't you go to God and bring their disputes to him instead of you dealing with all their disputes? Okay. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. This is cool. Before, they would come to him, and he would, like, one at a time, inform them of how God's decrees and instructions apply to what they were doing. This says, no, what I want you to do is, don't just do it on this small level. I want you to teach everyone. There's a difference between informing you on a personal level and teaching so that people are getting the information. Like, it's a larger span of your voice that everybody could be learning through all of these situations. That you teach God's decrees. You teach his instructions. Get, get a little bit more proactive. And show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people. Men who fear God. Trustworthy men. Who hate dishonest gain. I love that. He says, okay, I want you to find these guys, and I want them to have already have a, a proven track record of personal leadership. These are guys of character and that fear God. So like capable men, capable men too, from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials or leaders, judges, over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, at all times. But have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. I love that. Moses at that point is taking all of the leadership ownership on himself. And what his father-in-law says is, okay, that's not manageable. You can't deal with that many people. Not only will, will you burn out, but they're going to be mad because you can't get to them. And so what you need to do is, is have these other capable men, capable men who, who fear God and, and, 
aren't after dishonest gain and, and appoint them to these places to, to own some of this stuff with you that you're not carrying all of this by yourself and empower them to make decisions. That's awesome. Don't just put them there as some sort of puppet to like fill an org chart. But to say, listen, I, I trust that, that you fear God and that you're going to follow after his decrees and instructions. Um, and so you know what? Any dispute that, that falls underneath you, if you can figure it out, figure it out. Figure it out. With, with the, the ones that you're over, figure it out. If for some reason that's a, a problem, a dispute that you don't know how to figure out, that, that's a, a little bit over where you feel comfortable being able to handle right now, bring it to the next level. And then we'll deal with it. Huh. This is great leadership. A simple case they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, that's so rad. Instead of saying like, hey, God's telling you to do this, his father-in-law is saying like, here's some wisdom, but you should still take it to God. And make sure that this is what, <laughs> in alignment with what he wants you to do. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. How cool is that? Okay, Moses, you're going to wear yourself out. Um, if God commands and you do this, not only will, will, I mean, you're still going to have problems. They're just going to be the big ones. And, and they're going to come to you, but you're going to, it's a more manageable thing. You're going to bring the disputes to God. You're going to teach um, his decrees and instructions. You're going to show what it looks like to follow after him. Um, and, and you're going to deal with these big problems, but you're going to empower and appoint these other people to take on leadership. So now every person that comes to the dispute gets a hand-on touch. Like they, they, they get somebody they can actually talk to that cares and that is a part of their life. Like you're, uh, it's a smaller gathering w where there's a representative there. A leader, an official, a judge, it says. We don't like the term judge normally in our culture because we're afraid to get judged and have people be judges. Um, but leader, official in this space. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Uh, how many know that the, the power isn't just in hearing something but applying it? He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. What I love about this is where we're going to pick up next week is Moses going up on the mountain into the presence of God that God would give him all the laws and commands. We're going to look at the Ten Commandments and this interaction where Moses now is freed up of the everyday, all-day disputes that get brought to him where he can go into the, the, the face of God and get what God had for the people. I love that it's back-to-back -back like that. We see him apply this wisdom, and now he's freed up to go do what he's supposed to go do. And the, and the timing is divine and sovereign and beautiful, I want to read Acts 6 to you, but we're not going to today. Acts 6, 1 through 7. Um, you should read it on your own. We don't have time today. It's a New Testament example of a, a leadership issue that comes up and some things being delegated, responsibility, and, and an appointing of great people to take on uh, some pieces inside of what God's doing on mission. The, the widows, some of them weren't being fed. And people were mad at the apostles for that happening. And so the apostles say, like, appoint some men filled with the spirit and wisdom and, and have them do that. They pray over them and have them do that. And the Bible says that the, the word of God spread rapidly and, and that many more people were saved. I love this. This is, this is what I love about this story. Is that we see that God cares. We see that God cares about Moses the leader, and doesn't want him to get burned out, so he sends his father-in-law with wisdom. We see that God cares about the people and the disputes that are going on and didn't want them to not be satisfied and not have somebody that they could turn to for some sort of answers or judgment in the issues that they were having. 
that God cares so much that he gives a way for, for Moses to not be burnt out and overwhelmed and a way for his people to be cared for on a more personal level than waiting in line, two millionth in line, to talk to Moses. And that even in the New Testament, we see a breakdown when, when the apostles appoint, or, or these men are appointed and they pray over them and they'll, they'll, they'll serve the tables to make sure that the widows all get fed while the apostles go and pray and preach the word. And, and it's, it's not because they're too good to serve at the tables. But it's that everybody would walk in the role that God has placed them in for the care of God's people and the pushing forth of the gospel. That the word spread more rapidly because the, they were able to all fit into their spaces. And it shows that God cares for the people because it's not like, well, the widows just don't get food then because we got to go preach. It's no, God cares. He cares about what you're going through. He, he knows where you're at and that you're not meant to do this alone, that he's even structured inside of church leadership, that it would break down into small levels, that everybody doesn't just come to one person because it would not be good for any of us. And there's so much we can learn there. And I think, uh, I hope today we've, we've picked up some things from Exodus 17 and 18. And I want to pray for us. We have, a, we have a leader greater than Moses. And I love as we look at Israel fighting the Amalekites and Joshua and the people are down below with the sword. And Moses is up there on top of a hill with his arms up. That we have a Savior that went to the top of a hill with his arms wide open. As we fight in this world that we live in against enemies that are there, that the victory comes from him. That he isn't one that, that grew weary or gave up, but that he has pushed through and that our, our victory, our saving power is in Christ Jesus. He's the one we turn to, we depend on. He's supreme over everything, that Jesus is over everything. He's the banner that we wave. He's the one we're all born into and, and that brings us together to be family. That even with our quirks and our differences, he's the unifier of our differences. For his glory, for the edification and the strengthening of his people, for the pushing forth of the gospel in the community, for a witness to the world. Hmm. What I want to do is I want to I want to pray for us and I'm going to sing of God's goodness. Um, in fact, could you, could you stand with me for a moment as the worship team comes up? We're going to have prayer partners on the side uh, when I'm done praying and as we uh, sing of God's goodness. Don't run off. We're not uh, dismissed quite yet. Um, after we sing for a few moments, um, Billy's going to come up and talk to you about maybe what God's put on your heart today, the my next step today. I, I don't know what it is for you. Um, I don't know what God is maybe doing inside of your heart, maybe what God's revealed to you today um, but the awesome thing is that for all those who have put their faith in Christ the spirit of God lives inside of us that, that we all have access to the throne to go before him confidently and so I just I hope that during this time you would be prayerful about God what, what is it you're doing in me. Is there, is there a, a next step for me? Is there something that I should be uh, understanding? Is there maybe the word that you have for me today, God, is that I'm supposed to rest and be still in you? Maybe it's, I, I don't know what it is. But I hope that during this time, it's a time of response and, and that we would engage in what God is, is saying and, and doing, um, both corporately and in our lives personally.
And so in a moment, after we sing, Billy's going to come up and talk about some of the ways that we might respond today. Um, but I want to pray for us before that happens. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, I just I thank you for, for the work that you're doing. God, I thank you for um, your provision and, and your, your sovereign hand at work to take care of your people and all of the stories that we read today. And God, that you're still active and moving in our lives as you care and you're here. God, I pray that you move in miraculous ways. God, I pray that you would be softening the hearts that might be hard here today. God, that if we're blind to things, you would give us sight. God, where there is confusion, you would bring understanding. God, where there is some sort of question or hard thing we're trying to figure out, God, that you would confirm the way. God, maybe we're wrestling through something, we feel weak, we feel burdened. God, that we would take it to you that you would give us peace and that you would give us strength, boldness to walk in what you've called us to. Hmm. God, I pray that during these times we would be reminded that our identity is you, not in what we tell ourselves about ourselves, not in what other people tell us about ourselves, God, but who you say that we are as sons and daughters of you. God, we love you. God, we're grateful for your amazing love and grace and mercy. God, I pray that you would move in and through us. God, that we would understand even looking at the stories today that, that you are the leader of all of us and God, that we are not meant to do this alone but with you and with each other. Help us to work through what, what might be hard in that for us. God, I thank you for the things you're doing that I haven't even mentioned, but God, you know what's going on in our lives. I thank you that you're reaching us right there. In Jesus' name, amen.